We're going to jump right in today to the book of Psalm, the book of Psalm 92. I want to talk about what loving the church might look like, all right? What loving the church might look like and what kind of Christian life that might lead to. I want to begin basically by showing you a Bible verse that shows you the way to grow and that you'll realize the, the plan that God has for you and that you will see the most spiritual growth if you put yourself in an, in an environment for growth, right? You will see the most growth in your life if you put yourself in an environment for growth. And so I just want to start with a question today. How many of you could use a little bit of spiritual or emotional growth in your life? Me too. All right. That's why I'm here today. All right. Psalm 92 verse 13. Read it with me out loud. It's up on the screen behind me. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Amen. You really like that fat part, didn't you? I guess the Bible says it's okay to be fat. And because I'm spiritual, it's because I'm fat. And that's what, that's what people say to me, man, Pastor Mike, you must really be reading the word because you've been packing on the pounds lately. Yeah. But I want to look at this real quick, right? Those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Those that are planted in the house of God shall flourish. It doesn't say those who church hop will flourish. It doesn't say those who go to church once a month will flourish. It doesn't say those who go to church twice a year will flourish. And there's no condemnation. Just throwing it out. Reading what the Bible says. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of the God. And I love the second part where it says, hey, listen. If you're still breathing, it ain't too late. You're never too old to flourish for the things of God. Age is not a factor in the kingdom of God. Listen, you serve an eternal God. Your age don't matter. All right, God's like a gazillion years old. You're young. You're young. You're just a pup, all right? Here's my big idea today. If you get yourself in the right environment, good things can happen. If you get yourself in the right environment, good things can happen. If you've ever been in trouble, if you've ever hung out with the wrong crowd, you know that hanging around with the wrong people is going to get you in trouble, all right? But good things can happen when you get yourself in the right environment. I don't know about you, I don't know if you know this or not, but in America, there's a part of a country, our, our country called Death Valley. Anybody ever heard of Death Valley? This is my favorite part of the message right here, so pay attention. Death Valley. It's the hottest, driest place in America. Nothing there grows at all. Nothing grows at all. In fact, nothing grows because it doesn't rain there. There's no rain and it's hot. Everything is dry, it's burnt up. And that's why they call it Death Valley. In fact, I brought a picture for you today. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. Here's a picture of Death Valley. It looks like my face this morning before I put lotion on it. It's dry here right now, right? Anybody dealing with some dry skin in this weather change? I had to put a little lotion on my face today. Death Valley, dry, crusty, right? So that's a snapshot of it. But in 2014, in the winter of 2014, something happened. And they don't know how it happened or what the circumstances were for it to happen. But seven inches of rain fell in Death Valley in a short period of time. Now, nothing happened immediately, right? It, I mean, it, it flooded and eventually the, the water um, per permeated into the ground and penetrated the ground. Nothing happened. They didn't see any results of it because it's Death Valley. Everything's dead. But the phenomena happened in the spring of 2005. Put the next picture up. Just a few months later, all these flowers and plants popped up in Death Valley. And what they realized is this, my favorite part. Death Valley wasn't really dead. Death Valley was simply dormant. Put this up on the screen. Right beneath the surface of the ground were actually seeds of potential. 
that needed to be in the right environment for great things to happen. Just beneath the surface, there were seeds of potential that just needed the right environment for great things to happen. Are you seeing where I'm going with this yet? Have you identified personally with this yet? That there's, that, that there's some of you in here today that you've been going through a dry season. You, know, you might be going through a dry year, five dry years. You're like, you're saying to yourself, I, I think that there's something inside of me. I believe that there could be great potential inside of me, but I don't know how to release what's happening or what I'm feeling. I don't know, like, if I just got myself in the right environment. I believe the seeds of potential that are inside of me could blossom into something beautiful. There's some of you in here today that you know that there's something great inside of you or there's something more inside of you, but it just seems like there's something blocking. What is this thing blocking me from being me? And can I, can I be honest with you? Like one of the biggest blockages to you releasing your great potential you watch too much Netflix. You waste a lot of time. You're distracted. Like you're spending time doing nothing instead of working on your potential. Could you imagine a farmer like has uh, 400 acres of property and he's like, I just don't know why corn doesn't grow out in my farm. Cause you didn't go work the property. You didn't go plant seed. You're watching Netflix all day. Huh? Death Valley had seeds of potential just waiting for the right environment. Mm. The big idea today is this. You are somewhere on the spiritual continuum. You are somewhere along the path of spirituality. My hope today is to help you identify where you are and what your next step might be, okay? I'm not gonna pull any punches. This is a sermon a lot like what I preached a few months ago in our vision series. But I want you to personally identify where you are today and I wanna go a little bit deeper, all right? Where are you along the journey of life? My goal in this message today is to help you to identify and be like, wow, that's it right there. That's where I am and that's what needs to happen in my life in order for me to take that next step in my spiritual walk with the Lord, all right? And so I wanna look at this verse real quick in, in the book of Psalm 16 because our life is supposed to flourish. Don't raise your hand, but just analyze your life. Are, is your life flourishing right now? Are good things happening in your life? Are you full of joy when you wake up in the morning excited about what your day might bring? Or are you like, man, if just a few things fell in line, life would just be so much better, right? Because life should flourish. We, we know that. There's something in us that says life should be good. And I'm struggling with some things. Psalm 16 verse 1 says this, you will show me the path of life. You know, there's a huge revelation right there if you just pause for a second. David is speaking of the Lord and he says, God, you will show me. Who will show him? Right. So Google's not going to show you your path of life. Taking more college classes is not going to show you your path of life. It's just not. I mean, it's going to educate you and it might open up some doors, but it's not going to show you the path of your life. God, the creator of the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in it, the God that made man and breathed life into him and put the world in motion, he has the plan for your life. So it is only through God that you can understand the plan for your life. You will show me the path of life. He goes on to say, in your presence is fullness of joy. And at that right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, in other words, this is what he's saying. When I learn the path of my life from God, there's going to be joy in the presence of God. And I would say a lot of us, the reason why there's not joy in our lives is because we haven't first found the path of our life. 
We're not full of joy because we haven't settled into the purpose of our life. Listen, the purpose of life is not to get a job, make money, and die. That is not the purpose of your life. Can I just give you a a little snippet of what the simplest version of life is? Can, Can we? Just go all the way back, just break it down, ABCs. It's the only command God gave Adam and Eve. Or one of the two commands that God gave Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. <coughs> so I'm not talking about parenting. I'm talking about sharing your faith. I'm talking about reproducing who you are spiritually in someone else. Bottom line, basic truth. I'm supposed to tell somebody else about Jesus. Now, when that's not happening, which only 2% of Christians ever do share their faith, that's why we're not full of joy. But anyone who's ever shared their faith and someone has put their trust in God because you shared your faith, you know the immediate joy-filled response that comes with sharing your faith. I'm just throwing it out there, all right? Now, I would contend this. I would contend that people know that they have potential within them. Like, I know there's greatness in me, or I know that there's more in me, or I know I could be doing something. I know I could be making a difference. But they don't know what the journey or the path looks like. They don't know how to get there. They don't know how to get on that road. Where, all right, for example, we all know that we should exercise. But what happens between knowing, like, man, I really want to exercise and get healthy, and then when we come home from work? Everything changes, right? When we, see, when we see a commercial and someone's on there all like jacked and beautiful and walking down the beach in a bathing suit, you're like, oh man, I so want to get my beach body this summer. And then we get home from work. <laughs> and then it never happens. We get the groceries, you know, whatever, or we're, we cook dinner, we do homework with the kids, we watch Netflix. And the gym never happens, right? We, we know what we're to do, but we don't know how to get to that place where we actually want to do it. Or we get to that place where it's this overwhelming desire to do it. And so, do you know the path of your life? Do you know what the dash on your gravestone is supposed to represent? The dash I'm referring to is between your birth date and your death date. Do you know what the path, that dash, is supposed to mean? Do you know what the purpose for your life is? In Ephesians 1.17, Ephesians 1.17 through 19, and this is, we're going to camp out here, we're going to break this scripture down. It says this. Paul is speaking, and he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Who could use a little bit more wisdom up in here right now? Hey, now, Me. Use a little bit more financial wisdom, investment wisdom, retirement wisdom, right? Hello, somebody. I pray that, the, that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Revelation simply means like when I read the word, something speaks to me. There's a life, I get it, and like, wow, I read the scripture, I have to do something. The spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better that you may know God better. I love this part. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So we're going to stop here and look at this for a minute. And I want you to understand this. That the whole point to life is for us to get to a place that we know God. That we know God. Point number one today, if you're taking notes, is know God. Know God. I'm not talking about knowing about God. Knowing about God, knowing about religions, knowing about faith, agreeing that something must have created the world because, wow, it's just too complicated. All of that happens right here. But Paul didn't say that I want to open the eyes of your head. 
He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. You're in here today and you're in this room and you think that you're looking at me and watching me preach through your eyes in your head. But every single one of you right now are reading me through the eyes of your heart. You've come in here today and we're all experiencing the same stimulus. We're all experiencing the same lights, the same graphics on the screen, the same handsome man on stage. We're all experiencing the same stimulus, but we're reading it all differently. We're reading what's happening at this moment based upon our past experiences, based upon the lenses of our upbringing, okay? If you're from my dad's generation, you're looking up at me right now, my dad's 67, you're looking up at me right now, and you're like, oh dear Jesus. In my day, we would never wear ripped jeans, let alone pay for them ripped. In my day, poor people wore ripped jeans. My mother, when I ripped my jeans, would sew a patch into it. Huh? Come on. That's the lenses by which we should wear our best to the house of God. And I can't believe this boy's wearing ripped jeans on stage in a church. And you can't get past my appearance because of your lenses. Not based upon the fact that I'm preaching the word of God and some people's lives are going to be changed. Someone's going to get saved. Someone's going to get snatched out of hell and go to heaven. No, we don't see that. That's what these say. You know, that, th this tells us this boy can't do his job because he got ripped jeans on. Come on. Other people looking up in here says, he has a glitter heart on his shirt. John, I know you're already judging the glitter heart. You said something about the glitter heart. You're like, I can't believe my boy's wearing a glitter heart on stage right now. It's glitter, man. Everybody wish they had this glitter shirt right now. Yeah. Truth of the matter is, I just got one of those cricket machines, and I was kind of addicted to making t-shirts. So I've been making them out like, anyway, you get what I'm saying. All right. We're, you're not reading me with your eyes. You're reading me with your past. You're reading me with your upbringing. You're reading me with the lenses that have been put on you through your experiences and through your parents and your culture. I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many people left the church when we went from wearing suits to wearing blue jeans because to them, you can't serve God unless you wear a suit. But they call us when they need healing. No God. He said, I hope that the eyes of your heart would bring you to a place that you would know God. And Paul uses a word that hasn't been used in reference to God to this time. It's the word gnosko. Gnosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. If you're taking notes, gnosko. And it's the Greek word that literally means to know God in an intimate and personal way. And this was completely foreign to them because they only knew of a God of a religion. They only knew of God of a tradition, but he's using a word that means the way a husband knows a wife and they can make babies. Okay? But, but, but this word, it doesn't mean the same as it means in in, in like our English, it doesn't mean to know them, the act of it. I got like two kids right here, so I'm trying to be like very cautious as to what I say. It doesn't mean the act of it, it's talking about the intimacy of it. He, he's referring more to the fact that we're laying together and looking in each other's eyes and we're connecting soul to soul. We're talking about when we grow old together, and I still want to hold hands as we walk through the halls of the Galleria Mall <laughs> when I'm 87, still buying skinny jeans <laughs> from Amber Crombie and Finch. And we're talking about, 
or talking about life goals and dreams in a way that we're looking eye to eye and face to face. And I would say, if there's something broken in your marriage today, when's the last time you shut the TV off, shut the radio off, shut your cell phones off, and not sat up but laid down, held each other, looked in each other's eyes, and discussed where are we going with this? Ganasco. And these guys are sitting back and saying, wait, wait, we can do this? We can know God this way? We can have a relationship with God this way? It's moving the relationship and the knowledge of God from here to, I know him here. See, when we know something here, we can be convinced of something else. When we know something here, there's nothing that can change that belief. There's nothing that can change the fact that I know God here. (laughs) They had no idea that they could do this. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. And, And I love the way the message says it. He says, I wish that you could see God focused and clear. Focused and clear. Mm. He says, get your heart healed and start working on how you're seeing things. Because all of us in this room right now are seeing the exact same thing, but we're seeing it differently. We're seeing the exact same thing, but we're seeing it differently. And he says, I just wish you could see how important it is to know God and see things correctly. Then in the middle of this statement, in the middle of this verse, he says this, I pray that you have wisdom and understanding and enlightenment, that your eyes would be opened so that. These two words are very important. He says, so that, which means the second two things can't happen until the first two things happen. I want you to get this fixed so that this can happen. Come on. I wish you could understand the importance of this. All right? This is so important. He says, so that, I want these two first things to happen so that you might know the hope to which you have been called. What he's saying is, you'll never know your purpose. You'll never know the hope to which you are called until you get the first two things done. Are we getting this? Well, Pastor Mike, you haven't told us what the first two things are. Well, you know one of them, know God. Know God, all right? You cannot see if you don't first have know God and then the second thing in place. It's virtually impossible to see the plan that God has for you in the future if you're still looking through the lenses of yesterday. You cannot see tomorrow if your glasses are still covered with the smudges of yesterday's dirt. Some of you have even wondered, why don't I know what God's plan is for my life? It's because you haven't done the second step yet. Maybe you know God. Maybe you believe in God. Maybe you have given your life to Jesus Christ. But for some reason, you don't know the plan for your life. You don't know the purpose for your life. You don't know how to uh, have healthy relationships. You don't know how to make a difference in the world. It's because you probably haven't done the second step. And the second step is this. Once you know God, you need to find freedom. Find freedom. Find freedom. You're here today... So, Pastor Mike, I, I'm not in bondage. We all are to something. To something. Well, I'm not an addict. I don't have an addiction problem. No, but you're angry. You're angry, and everybody walks around on eggshells around you because they don't want to push your buttons. Because when they push your buttons, then you're going to go off. And it was someone else's fault for you being undisciplined. Right? It's a problem. And you find freedom from that. The reason why most people never find their purpose is because they never first found freedom. Do you know why most people never submit themselves and surrender to find freedom? 
They're afraid that if somebody knows what I struggle with, they won't love me. There's someone in here today, you drink too much alcohol. You drink way too much alcohol. And instead of finding help, you ignore the problem because you fear that if someone knows you drink too much, you might lose your job. You fear that if someone knows you drink too much, you might lose your marriage. If someone here today, you have a problem with things that you look, at, you look at on the internet. You're looking at the wrong things. And instead of finding help, you hide it and you ignore it because you believe that your spouse will judge you so harshly that they would leave you. And so we hide it. And we hide the things we struggle with so deep and so far that we don't even know ourselves. So we can't find our, our purpose. We can't find our future. We can't find the path that God has for us because we're so busy hiding the things that we struggle with. We push them down and we suppress them. Come on, man, I'm trying to... We wear this mask and we're afraid that if we take the mask off and show what's behind the mask, that people won't love us for who we are. And so we never step into that path of the purpose that God has for us because we're too busy hiding our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Mm. He says this. I, he says, I want you to find freedom so that you may know the riches of the glories of God. He says, I want you to find freedom so that you can have an inheritance in the holy place with God. Can, can we just be straight for real for a second? It's a shame. It's a shame that people are afraid to find freedom in church because of the gossip and judgment of other Christians. It's a shame. It's a shame that people don't feel that they could come to a healing place and get actually healed and set free because someone might find out their business and tell somebody else about it. I'm just putting this out there. Those kind of people that would do that aren't going to last long here at Family Church. Because Family Church is a healing place. Family Church is a place that we can come and we can take off the mask and we can see the ugliness behind the mask and we can say... Yeah, you're ugly, but we love you ugly. We love you some ugly, all right? But God don't want to keep you in ugly because God said that you're beautiful, that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you've been made in his image and after his likeness. And God loves taking the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He loves taking the ugly, broken pieces and putting them back into a, a way that is the most beautiful masterpiece that the world has ever seen. And, and I'm just saying today that the reason why maybe you haven't stepped into the full purpose to that which God has called you is because you've allowed the lie of the world to keep you ashamed of your pains and your hurts and that you haven't found freedom from it. You haven't found freedom from your past. You haven't found freedom from your anger. You haven't found freedom from alcohol. You haven't found freedom from drugs. You haven't ha found freedom from sexual addiction and you're still playing with it. And listen, and just, I just, I just got to be honest. I got to throw this out there today. The reason why you're not living in the fullness it's not because God is convicting you. And it's not because God is condemning you. It's because you don't have any confidence. You know what you're doing. You know what you're dealing with. And therefore, you've allowed the knowledge of that to rob you of your confidence to stand before God. This is the biggest lie that we've ever been taught. That when you feel guilty, that that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. That's the biggest lie in the world. If that was true, if that was true, then how come you don't feel guilty every time you speed? 
you only feel guilty when you speed when you see those red and blue lights behind you. All of a sudden, oh, Jesus! Jesus, have mercy on me! That's the only time you feel guilty. But you weren't feeling guilty when you had your music go, What you feel when you do wrong is that you violated your own moral compass. Because if you really knew God, if you knew God, what you would hear is him saying, you are the righteousness in God in Christ Jesus. You are the head and not the tail, above and never beneath. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I love you just the way you are. You don't have to do this. You're better than this because I made you. You're my child. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Oh, but we don't hear that. Because we don't know God, we know someone else's religion. We know someone else's religion who taught us something to keep us in line. A religion will never give you freedom and liberty. A relationship will. A relationship brings freedom. A relationship brings joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you're in here today and what I'm saying is angering you, it's because you have a religion, you don't know my Jesus. You don't, you, don't, you don't know my Jesus. You don't know the one who died for you, gave his life for you. And so we can't begin this life of joy filled, joy, join this, right? Joy. Because we haven't surrendered. We haven't surrendered. Know God. Find freedom. Finding freedom is going to be the hardest step in the Christian life, right? So where am I on the spectrum? Where am I in this walk with the Lord? Maybe I don't know God yet. Maybe I'm out here. I'm far from God. Well, then the next step would be to know God. Maybe I know God, but I'm not free. I'm not free to dance. I'm not free to sing. I mean, the worship team does their hardest to engage us, and we just stand there. Because I'm not free. I'm not free. Because the Bible says this, where the Spirit of the Lord, there's freedom. There should be freedom. There should be freedom to sing, freedom to dance, freedom to, to, to express ourselves in a way that, that, that goes with the, the worship and all these things. Freedom. To do what? So that. I have to know God and find freedom so that, what? I can discover my purpose. Discover your purpose. Discover your purpose. I will never discover my purpose where I'm wearing a false mask. Because who, who, who's it really for? Who am I supposed to be when I'm not even real? When I'm being fake? Know God. Find freedom. Discover my purpose. To do what? Make a difference. Know God. Find purpose. I'm sorry. Love God. Find freedom. Discover my purpose. Make a difference. Where are you? on this path today. As I took some time last week, I'm gonna be very, very real and transparent with you right now, okay? I took last weekend off because I was burning out. Um, I live life very fast. I live life, I put out a lot of content, I've got new ideas, fast, 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 fast. and. I was burning out. And when I burn out, it, it's ugly. Um, I'm either on or off, <laughs> right? And so like I run until I crash. And if I crash, it's ugly. My crashes hurt people. Um, my crashes are depressive. They're self-sabotaging. And I was feeling myself go there. I was feeling the old me the parts that I don't like creeping back. And uh, instead of crashing in front of my staff and crashing in front of the church, I need a break. So I took last week off, right? Went away, spent some time with the Lord. Seriously, like spent some time with God and prayed and 
completely alone time. Then I, I met up with my family later on the weekend and we went to a water park and spent some time together as a family to refresh. Um, and I was talking to the Lord about, I can't give my life for something that is not going to make a difference. I can't do everything well. God, I need to know, like, what's the most important thing? What is the number one question that I feel everybody struggles with? What's the one thing that I think that everybody, Christian, non-Christian, sinner, saint, believer, non-believer, multiple religions, what is the one thing that people ask in life? And I think it boils down to how do I know God? How do I know this is real? How do I know God is real? How, how can I commit my eternity to something that there's really not a whole lot of proof? If we don't believe the Bible, it kind of throws out our benchmark. Like, well, if, if the Bible's not of God, then what do we really have? And how do I know God? That needs to be the fundamental question that we search after, Right? Because even baby Christians can go to heaven. You don't have to be philosophically and theologically correct to go to heaven. You need to believe. Listen to what I'm saying here. Listen to what I'm saying. There's a thief on the cross next to Jesus, and he says, Lord, how do I enter into heaven? And he says, well, today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't have time to become a mature Christian. He believed he was saved. The most important thing is that we come back to God. That we have a relationship with God. So we got to get to know God. But how will others get to know God if you don't go make a difference? How will your family and your friends know God that may never walk in the doors of a church, but you can take church to them? You are the vessel that God placed in this generation to reach people that I could never reach, that the church could never reach. You're, you're called to make a difference. Mm. That's why I love being part of the church. It's because God's made it very simple to join the family of God, to become a member of believers. I think we overcomplicate it. But I just want to throw out there today, do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? Not, not an idea of a religious system. Not a set of rules that you feel guilty if you don't fulfill them. Do you know God? I mean, it would be so simple if, like, we prayed and as after we said amen, we heard, Michael, I have an assignment for you today. <coughs> but we don't, right? It's, it's, not, it's, it's not that way. I mean, maybe, maybe you've had that experience, but it's not. But could you be the answer for your neighbor? Could you be a light for someone else who's hurting? Could God use that story of your past to bring freedom to somebody else? Here's my, here's my struggle with, with, with where I was at and what I was looking at. I read Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus is speaking, he said this, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wait, what? He says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is actually a Christian. Not everybody who goes to church on Sunday and knows how to wear the outfit just right is going to heaven. He said, what do you mean? We prophesied in your name. We laid hands on the sick. We saw signs and wonders. He said, yeah, that's all great. You knew about me. You knew how to do the dance. You knew how to wave your hand. But I never knew you. 
Do you know what word he uses there? He uses the word ganasco. He said, you knew about me? You knew about our religious system? He said, but I never ganascoed you. I never shared the secrets of my covenant with you because you never got close enough. You wanted the act of church. You wanted the mask, but you didn't want me. Here's the funny thing. If you haven't found freedom, what you're really, 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 really wanting. Huh. You want to know that if you take the mask off, that the person you're with wants the person underneath the mask. Do you love me for the mask or do you love me for what's beneath the mask? Come on. And he's saying, he's saying here, I've always seen through your mask. I've always seen through here. Here's the thing you got to understand about God. He saw your beginning and your end. He saw your entire life. He knew every decision you were going to make. He knew every mistake you were going to make. He knew every sin you were going to commit. And he says, I take all that to an account and I still choose you. I still choose you. I still choose you. With all of that, I still choose you. I still choose you. I still call you. I still want you. I still love you. So he said, would you find freedom? Would you find freedom? On Thursday nights, we have a freedom group. We have a Bible study that we host. It's one of the most powerful programs that we have going on in the church to help people and coach them along in finding freedom in their life. If you'd like more information about Thursday Night Bible Study, find somebody that you know is connected to the church. Find Michael Martz, Sue Martz. Um, talk to them about it, about what, what you can do to find your next step and find some freedom in your life. Maybe you've found freedom and, and the joy of the Lord is your strength, but you haven't stepped into the purpose of your life yet and you're still wondering, like, what can God use in my life? Listen, we need people in children's ministry. We need ushers. We need greeters. We need band members. We need singers. Here's, here's what happens in a church our size. You look on this stage and you say, well, there's already four singers and you only have four microphones. So we don't got only four microphones. You don't know what I have. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't want, you know, like you have four people on stage already. You don't need me. Yes, we do. Because they need a break. They'd like to have one service off. All right? We, we, we're, we want to launch some more services. We want to launch a new church and another campus. We need more singers. We need more band members. We need more preachers. We need more ministers. All right? Because we build leaders. That's what we do. We develop leaders. Don't, don't, don't sit there today and say, yeah, well, there's potential in me, but, but you know, you don't. Why, 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 why? Why are you telling anybody what they need? God is calling you. God is calling you. He put potential in you before you breathe your first breath for this season of life. He deposited a church. Listen to this right now. Somebody needs this. Somebody in here today, you've allowed yourself to become so insecure. You need to hear this today. Before the foundation of the earth, God planted a treasure in you that he knew he was going to need in this season of the world. And he's calling that deposit out of you today. He's calling out of you today those treasures that he's planted in you, those seeds of potential that he planted in you. And, and the world may has, have called you a death valley. The society may have called you dead valley. The, your friends and your family may have written you off. You may have, you may have messed up in your past and people wrote you off and they said, you're dead. You're dead to me. You're dead to the family, whatever. And, and you've believed a lie that you could never really do anything great in your life. And God's saying, I'm calling dead things to life again. 
Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Remember, remember, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me shall be saved, right? He's saying, listen, I can call. You know, Jesus is the only person in all of history who rose himself from the dead. He can raise those dead things in your life back again. He can heal that broken marriage right now. That, that dead relationship, that dead marriage, that the, that, that, that the fire has gone out. And he, he calls it back to life again. And someone in here today, mm, you, know that, you know that dark valley of depression that I was talking about. Who I feel it. I feel my chest getting tight, just like right now as I'm speaking to you, you feel like you're getting that anxiety that you deal with. You see, worry is reflecting on the past. Worry, worry is thinking about all your mistakes and your hangups and all those things in the past. Anxiety, you know what anxiety is? Anxiety is fear about the future. Anxiety is creating stories that never even happened. You know what? When you get that panic attack, it's because you're writing a story. You, you're making things up like, what if this and what if this and what if that and what if that? Someone today, you need to find freedom from depression, anxiety. I'm not trying to be weird to you. I'm not trying to be weird, please. I'm, I know this could look a little weird. There's someone in here today that you deal with depression so bad that your kids are seeing it. And it's rubbing off on them. And I'm feeling an urgency today that if that if you if you'd find freedom from that if you if you'd find the joy of the lord you'd be saving your kids life like that depression that depression that you could pass to that generation they they're not going to know how to deal with it the way that you've been trying to deal with it and if you could find that freedom today you'd be saving your kids life you'd be saving a next generation if you would if you find the help, say, Holy Spirit, let the joy of the Lord be my strength. And I'm not trying to be weird in here today. Please understand. But I'm feeling this heavy on my heart today. They need to bring joy in your home. You got to get the yelling out of the house. You got to get the screaming out of the house. You got to get the fighting out of the house. Bring the joy of the Lord. Bring some, some, some light music or some Christian music into your home to bring lightness and, and freedom into your home. And, and when you feel that anger and that frustration, take a moment, get away from the situation, leave the room, compose yourself, come back and bring life back into that situation. There's a, there's, there's a, gener, there's a generation of kids that don't know how to deal with these emotions the way that we've been trying to. If it's not for us, it's for our kids. The joy of the Lord be your strength. Father, I pray today that the peace of God would reign richly in our hearts and in our minds. I pray, God, today that those who may be far from God, that right now the Holy Spirit would be drawing them close, that they're feeling the tug on their heart, not in their head, not their understanding, but they're feeling a difference in their heart today, that there needs to be a change, that there's a drawing to you. God, I, I pray right now that they would find you, that they would know that you are the one true living God. The, Lord, for those that have come in here today and they have found the, the eternal life through Jesus Christ, but they haven't found freedom. They're still dealing with things of the past and addictions and, and strongholds. That God, I pray right now that freedom is in this house. Freedom is in this place. That they would connect themselves to a group of believers that are going in the way of the Lord, that are making right decisions that can encourage them in their walk. And I thank you, Lord, for that today. Lord, I pray for those that are on the path to finding freedom, that they would know their purpose. 
They would know their purpose for why you created them and why they are here today. And God, I pray for doors of opportunity to open for them to fulfill the purpose that you've called them to. And Lord, for all of us, I pray for opportunities to make a difference, to make a difference in the world today, to make a difference in the lives of those who are around us. So Lord, I pray that your word will never return to you void. It will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. I thank you that everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful. We're blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you.